Thank you so much. And a little plug for Marcus Hendricks. I went on the walk in Wellfleet last week. He's awesome. Really interesting. So if you get a chance to, to do that. Okay, so what we're going to do uh, for the next 30, 40 minutes is take a social, historically accurate social justice walk around Cape Cod. And so how this whole project came to be was through the beginnings of the pandemic. So just a little bit about me, I've worked in higher ed my whole career, and I'm a consultant and an executive coach with many nonprofits on the case, a certified mediator, and I do retreats for women. And I created this thing called the Cape Cod Camino Way, really out of a convergence of two pandemics, but I'd say multiple pandemics. So we had the global you know, COVID-19 pandemic, March of 2020, everything gets shut down, you can't travel. If you remember back, it was very scary, you know, how we were all um, kind of stuck with each other and trying to figure out what are we going to do next. And I usually travel outside the country once or twice a year. So I had to think, like, what am, what am I going to do now with, with this time and how do I continue my learning about other cultures? And you'll see what that turned into. We also had a lot of black people being killed, um, and especially the George Floyd murder really hit people very hard, including me and including many people on Cape Cod. And then, you know, thinking through what, what should our government response to all this be, state, local, uh, national. So I decided to take Cape Cod, <laughs> our beloved arm, and consider it my own version of the Santiago de Compostela in Spain, the Camino that goes from many different points uh, in Portugal, France, and across Spain, and ends up at, at the uh, Santiago um, de Compostela, the church. And really, I said, let me take a pilgrimage on Cape Cod and look for people, places, and stories that I don't know much about that I really need to know. And that connects both historically, because I was an undergraduate history major at UMass Amherst, <laughs> love history, I'm a member of the Brewster Historical Society, the Naples Historical Society, etc. But connect that with contemporary issues going on today. And so that's how this adventure started in the summer of 2020. I decided to start walking uh, the 4th of July week, and I was going to finish by Labor Day. And so every Wednesday, I walked up to 15 miles. I would post the route on Mondays, in case anyone wanted to join me. And over the course of the summer, 43 different people did, most of them relatives or friends or somebody who knew, knew me, knew, you know, knew someone who knew me. But what I did was I, I would map out the route, and I'm going to take you on a quick version of this, and I would take in people and places that were right there that either I had never been to or I needed to go back and delve into it deeper. And then I would post where we went. I'd have photos. I'd have a video blog on Facebook. So every week about 200 people from around the world were following me as I walked, and I touched every town on Cape Cod. That was my goal. So, here we go. You're going to go on this journey with me. So the first week um, was our introduction. It was Fourth of July week. So I chose to explore our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And so I wanted to share with you a couple of things. I knew that in the Constitution, it said that there was this compromise that our founding fathers put together, that uh, Africans who were brought here as enslaved people counted as three-fifths of a person, right? So that's in our Constitution, that every state ratified, okay? But what I didn't know 
when I went back and read the Declaration of Independence, that it had this, this sentence. King George has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule is warfare, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, wow, that's in the Declaration of Independence? So I read that to the friends who were with me. There was four of us walking this day. And we just stopped and thought about, what does it mean if you are a person of color or a Native American reading our founding documents? How does that hit you differently than if you looked like I do? And we just talked about it. Every time we walked and we heard a church bell, or like on this one, if a, if a boat went by on the canal, um, we would pause. And so as a pilgrimage, you, I asked our people with me to pause, you know, inhale deeply, think about what's going on for you, what does it mean, and then let's keep walking. So sometimes when we walked, we talked. Other times we were in silence, and both were, were a nice way to do it. Um, let me get back over here. Whoops, sorry. Going back and forth here. Yeah, where's my... Whoops, whoops, whoops. Just give it a second, it'll kind of go away. There we go, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, and so we, we talked about the trade that happened between the original colonists, descendants of the Mayflower, etc., and the fact that that week and month, uh, there was this big focus on Plymouth 400 and the celebration of the Mayflower. And so I joke that I was followed by the pilgrims all across Cape Cod, and you'll see them play out in a few other ways as we go along. And so I give credit to Lauren McClavick. She walked all eight weeks with me, and if you've never walked both sides of the canal, it's a challenge <laughs> to do that. So the week two, um, I decided to use, I tried to use the bike paths as much as possible. So one of the issues of social justice across Cape Cod is how do people who have any mobility issue mm. access many of our places, the environment, historical museums, historical sites, etc. I ended up walking miles without sidewalks, including parts of 6A, Route 28. I don't think I was ever on Route 6 without a sidewalk, but it's pretty dismal in some places in terms of how we can access things. So what I decided to do is go from Woods Hole, from Falmouth to Woods Hole. I wanted to look, because Woods Hole has this focus on science, and I knew some folks at NOAA and uh, HUI, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, I interviewed women and people of color that stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, BIPOC. In science, I read their material. They had just done a big report about why are women and people of color not uh, represented as much in science. And so it, it talked with um, some of the systemic issues in education that starts in second, third, fourth grade from even from what like problems, math problems are given um, that are typically written in ways that appeal to boys instead of girls, all of that. Anyone in education might know more about this than I do for that. But you can see in that photo that we had three women scientists with us from Woods Hole, and we also had a couple of high school girls who joined me. And it was really interesting to watch the interaction between the high school girls who even today were saying, you know, there were maybe four of them in the physics AP class at Falmouth High School, or, you know, five of them in the math AP compared to the number of boys. And like, why is that? 
And my sister-in-law is a th theoretical math professor at the Coast Guard Academy. She's also from Trinidad, so she's black. So I went and asked her, what was your experience? I've, she's been my sister-in-law for 10 years. I had never sat and asked her about her experience like that. So again, it led to just being open to exploring more what her experience was and how did she still get through math and to become a math and physics professor. So the other thing I want to share with you from this walk was um, we met at the Kathy Lee Bates statue and it popped into my head, I wonder how many statues of women there are on Cape Cod. So on this walk I found two of them, Kathy and then Rachel Carson, the noted environmentalist at Woods Hole, right? But, so then I said, all right, let me go back and, and really look at the, um, the text for America the Beautiful. I've sung it, we've probably all sung it, right, at many different events. The original version of the song was first written as a poem in 1893, when Bates was a professor at Wellesley, and she traveled from her hometown of Falmouth across the country, and she was really taken by the scenery and wanted to capture that. So I won't read the whole song or attempt to sing it, but the, the final stanza of the original poem, again, jumped out at me from looking at things in a different way. It says, America, America, God shed his grace on thee, till nobler men keep once again thy whiter jubilee. That, that stanza was eliminated from the song. It did not show up in the next two versions of the poem. So again, it gave us something to look at and think about. Here we had just experienced the murder of George Floyd. And I started thinking, what does it mean to have a song that was about establishing thy whiter jubilee? Just a question kept us going as we were walking. That was the Sipawesset Marsh there, and when we stopped there, we talked a little bit about the environment and things, really positive things that um, the Association to uh, Preserve Cape Cod is doing, how each of our towns has great conservation areas, etc., and how we can plug into that. Okay, the third walk. This one was really tough for a lot of reasons. One is I went five miles on 28 without sidewalks in the rain. I do not recommend anyone do that. But we started at the Mashpee Wampanoag Museum. And remember, it's COVID, so many of these museums were closed, but you could still interact in different ways. I spoke to one of the people who worked there. I got information from their website. And then we started our walk behind the museum, where we saw a wee too, like you have on the back wall here. There was a dugout canoe, etc. And so we really dug into what was going on with the Wampanoags back when the first colonists came. And you know the story of first encounter and all of that. But then what does it mean today to still be trying to argue for appropriate federal recognition for the tribe because they had just had their recognition taken away um, about three or four years ago. Um, so that became part of our conversation. And then we walked through all the towns, Osterville, Centerville, Marston's Mills, and over to Hyannis to look at how um, and end up at the Zion Union Heritage Museum, which, has anyone been there yet? Highly recommend you go. I'll show you a few photos there. But the couple of stories I want to pull out from here about, um, quote, social justice related, is when we think about if we, since our first elections in this country, and I should know the date of that, but 1790-something probably, right? 92. After the Constitution was approved, when did George Washington first become president? 
1789. So since then, um, there haven't been, there's been some women in our elected senior leadership positions, but not many over the course of hundreds of years. In the Wampanoag history, they were a matrilineal culture. The women influenced greatly who became sachem in that local area. And so again, some of us started talking about, well, what would our country look like if from the beginning, instead of it being, you know, white, land-holding, wealthier men, who were the voters and who organized all the systems of democracy, what if women were involved in that? It took until the early 1900s for white women to be enfranchised with the vote, right? And then it took another 60 so years for black women to be enfranchised, or blacks in general. So what would our country be like if from the beginning, or somewhere along the way, it changed. And so again, we just had that conversation as we, we went along. The other thing that happened here, I think I have the photo next. Oh, so this is, yeah. So this is a photo of my family here. I, there's a couple things I want to point out. One is, we're wearing t-shirts. Three or four of us had the Kate Camino Way uh, logo and t-shirts. And that's my sister-in-law. That's my, she would have been six then, my niece, eight, eight years old now. Obviously, people of color. So we were racially profiled on this walk. Mm -hmm. And it was shocking to me. Mm -hmm. Because here I am, I've, lived, I've owned a house in Brewster for 20 years. I've walked everywhere on Cape Cod. And never when I was by myself did anything like this happen. But we had stopped to take a water break. We were kind of spread out. And some um, maintenance guys, lawn maintenance guys, who were working in one of the towns, Centerville or Osterville, we were around some really beautiful homes, um, came up to my sister-in-law and asked, what are you doing here? Oof. Or why are you here? And my brother kind of heard it. I didn't hear it. And so he said, well, can't you see we're on a walk and we're taking a break? And the guy said, oh, OK, whatever, and walked back to his yard. I can almost guarantee you that if that picture didn't have a person of color in it, that wouldn't have happened. And so as we kept walking, my brother said, do you realize what just happened here? And I said, no, what? And he explained it to me. And then I, of course, went up to my sister-in-law and apologized. And I then walked on in silence because I'm on a pilgrimage. And I had to integrate what just happened to them, but also by extension, me, because I didn't really notice it. And that was something to think about. Then we got to, this, this is the Zion Union Heritage Museum. So it's an old church that's converted into a museum. And so on the wall are all of these icons of about 40 different people of color, including the only president of color. But interestingly enough, on the wall is a man named Brace. We grew up across the street from a black family in Springfield named Brace. It's their descendant, and he was a, originally an enslaved person. So it brought full circle for my family, this experience, again about social justice, like who's on the walls of museums or not, or, or, or um, uh, yeah, the, the museum. So this walk was really interesting. All 6A, which we all love, it's beautiful. There's all kinds of historical markers and cemeteries and places to stop. And as you look at the names of some of those places, Association to Preserve Cape Cod, Capabilities, um, the Barnstable District Court, all of them have connections to social justice issues. So what's going on in policing? 
And again, we had just had the George Floyd issue, and so there was a big meeting between the NAACP and the police chiefs, and one of the police chiefs was quoted as saying, um, it was uh, Captain Fred Fredrickson from Yarmouth, we don't even look at this as a racial incident for the most part. We see a human being getting knelt on, and it didn't really matter what color the person was. And so I also interviewed John Reed, who was the president of the NAACP, and he said, well, if you're a person of color, it really did matter what color the person was. So again, there was, and that's how they came together to have an open dialogue and discussion about it. I'm all, all about promoting dialogue and hearing our dis differences and working through our issues. And until we do that, we're really never going to be able to move forward. So I was really glad to hear that the, the police chiefs and the NAACP came together that summer on the Cape to try to understand it better. That's Mercy Otis Warren. Um, you, some of you might know a little bit about Mercy. But what I like to share about Mercy is that she, again, from a little bit of a, like, where are women in the history of the American Revolution? So Mercy is the most famous woman of the American Revolution that 99.9% .9 of us have never heard anything about in the history books or in school. Instead, we, we hear about Betsy Ross sewing a flag. Mercy corresponded for decades with John Adams, back and forth, letters, uh, with, with Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Sam Adams, James Madison. After the Constitution was drafted, it was sent out to all the states, as I mentioned, Mercy read it and wrote a response back to the, to the guys who wrote it. And she gave a draft of what is the Bill of Rights. She has never been appropriately given credit for that. Others probably gave similar responses too, but to think that she did that and really didn't get, she was an activist back in the American Revolution, but never really got credit for it. We walked, um, this is 6A, again, there was a lot going on about voting, because it was 2020. So we had some good discussion about voting and then, um, you know, the signs, a lot of historical markers along 6A that give you a sense. This is right near, has anyone been to this site? Uh, yeah, that right on 6A in Dennis. Fabulous burial ground there on Scargo Lake. Highly recommend taking a trip down to watch to stop there. Okay, our next walk focused on Again, a big social justice issue. Here's COVID. Here's our healthcare system in the country that only mm, six, seven years ago, the Affordable Care Act had opened it up to millions of more people, including a lot of low income and people of color. And so I went and I interviewed the head of Emerald Physicians, Dr. Kamara Siddhartha, and he talked a lot with us about um, how COVID's disproportionate impact was hitting um, people of color, including here on Cape Cod. And he brought in issues like, if you take into consideration the social determinants of health, meaning housing, having a good job, having health insurance, language barrier if you go into access health care, um, and just cultural factors about how people grew up, sedentary lifestyles versus active, access to sports and after school programs, all that stuff. What kinds of food are available, um, in, especially in desert food areas? We don't have as much of that, well actually some places on Cape Cod we do. But he brought it up in terms of it really, COVID was impacting um, the people of color population differently. 
So we talked about that. And as we walked along, we also focused a lot this day on mind, body, spirit, total health. So we met up, we walked from um, Dennis over to Chatham, and we did a walk with Pilgrim's Landing at the, at the Chatham Labyrinth and had an experience together that was actually quite profound. And um, two of the people in there, one is a grandmother and a granddaughter, and they just said how impactful it was for them, not only to go on three or four of these walks, but to do the labyrinth together brought them to like a closer understanding of each other. Um, so that was a real nice moment for us. That's over the, uh, in the middle of Harwich there. Just again, gives you a sense of what it was like walking with people. Some people wore masks, others did not that summer. I show this because it's a really good example of how a historical society can advance issues around social justice, and maybe they don't even know they're doing it. So the Atwood was closed the, the Wednesday we walked through. So I went back that Saturday, it was open for a few hours, and my dad was in D-Day, and I love looking at World War II, uh, so they had a room about World War II. And I walked in and immediately my eyes went to this photo, and I said, oh my God, there is a woman of color as a Rosie the Riveter. I had never seen that. Mm -hmm. Most of us probably have never, ever seen a person of color either as the, the Sam, the, the character joined the army, or Rosie the Riveter. So I went up to the curator of the exhibit at, from Hatwood, and I just said, oh my God, thank you. This is outstanding. He didn't realize it was there. Mm -hmm. And then he thanked me for bringing it to his attention, and he said, I'm going to go back in our archives. We might have some more photos. That would be helpful. So again, you know, I kind of never knew what was going to happen when, when I went to a place or took on a walk. And that's kind of what happened the next week in my own hometown of Brewster. So walk six was Brewster, Orleans, and East Ham. And I knew a little bit about our sea captains. I knew a little bit about some of them maybe being involved with the institution of um, enslaved peoples. But basically, when you think about it, our, our, our men went to sea for three reasons, whaling, fishing, and trade. And trade included goods and people. And so there's a lot more really good work being done by the historical societies in particular, including Brewster, um, about their connections with the triangle trade. And you probably have heard the story of codfish, codfish being dried, sent to the Caribbean to feed the enslaved population. I had never heard that until two and a half years ago when I started this. Never heard that. But our folks, our, you know, mm -hmm. our ancestors dried the fish, sent it in barrels that they made here with our wood on ships that were made here, and went down to the Caribbean and they dropped it off. And then they brought back sugarcane to make into molasses, rum. rum. Rum was our drink, right? And then we had this whole connection with, you know, New Orleans and Mobile, Alabama, and North Carolina, and you go in any major historic cemetery on Cape Cod, and you will find died in Africa, died in Havana, Barbados, Mobile, all these sea captains who somehow died in all these slaveholding territories. Now, I'm not saying that all our sea captains by any means. It's probably, if I had to guess from what little research I've done, five or 10 percent who were involved in the trade, but, but we did have people involved that way. And so we, we took a hard look at that, and um, including um, the Cobb House, Elijah Cobb. There's some documented evidence that he um, became the captain of the Ten Brothers over off the coast of Africa, 
sailed back through Martinique with an unspecified cargo, then went to Boston, and when he got to Boston, he was accused of being uh, a slave trader, but also bringing um, uh, yellow fever to Boston, a public health threat. He was found innocent of both. He was supposed to go burn his ship around the corner there at Boston Harbor. He didn't, and on and on. So this is kind of hard for the historical society to wrap their heads around, for all of us to wrap our heads around, because that's where the Brewster Historical Society is housed, mm -hmm. you know, in Cobb's house. So what do we do with that now? Mm -hmm. And we're continuing. See, that's, that's one of the ones. Benjamin Crosby died in Africa, 1795. That's behind the UU Church in Brewster. Captain Freeman in, similar. Mm -hmm. So I just thought all these great sea captains' homes on 6A that are inns and restaurants, oh, they all got their money from China or, you know, India or Car somewhat the Caribbean. So it just it, it helped me understand I need to dig more. Now this is up near you, obviously, where we, um, where we walked through Fort Hill and I brought them to, to the Indian Rock there. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that because you know that story so well um, up in here in, in East Ham. The next week we went, this is a really tough walk. If anybody tells you the Cape is flat, they are crazy because they have not walked Wellfleet to Truro, uh, especially from Tr uh, Wellfleet Center at Preservation Hall. The next five, six miles is all hills out into Truro. But this week we chose to focus on um, who, who do we listen to in music? Who do we read as poets? And so I asked the people who I knew were coming, there was about 10 people coming, could you bring a poem or a song? And so people had their iPhones out playing music, things that we don't normally listen to. And we had walkers from age like 13 to 80 this week. It was really pretty, pretty interesting. And so one of the girls, oh, when we walked through Wellfleet, I did pull up on my phone that the town seal, and this is so classic on Cape Cod. So Wellfleet is wrong, Truro's is wrong, and Barnstable has a Mayflower in it also. So here you have um, Wellfleet having what I think happened in East Ham, <laughs> me and Avery. They came, it kind of looks like first encounter, <coughs> right? And like, hi, I'm here, you know, and they're, they're being welcomed. And, but look at the headdress mm -hmm. here. This is not a Northeast United States headdress. And if you go to, whoops, sorry. If you go to um, the Truro town seal, I don't know if I put that in there. No, I didn't. But the Truro town seal is a little bit even worse. It has a full native headdress. It has a teepee on the beach, <laughs> which our natives did not use teepees. And what's the third thing? Hogan. There's three things that are wrong with the seal. Well, Hogan. Hogan. Yeah. Around us. Oh, maybe that's it. Yeah, so I just ask this again, like, what, what's our obligation to portray things a little bit accurately if we're going to be using those symbols? Then the last week we went um, from uh, the public library in Truro all the way out the shore road of 6A uh, into Provincetown. So a couple things connected to social justice, again, we all, we have this, we have the benefit of a tourism economy. And we have people from all over the world, particularly the Caribbean and the Eastern European countries, who are staffing our restaurants and stores and all of that. Well, where do all these people live? I actually walked by on this walk where several of them live. Campgrounds, trailers, um, little cottage colonies in Truro that are off of 6A that I never noticed before. But again, because you're walking, 
you see more of what is actually going on. There were flags, Jamaican flags flying from homes and that kind of thing. And it was just so different than the 6A down in Barnstable or Yarmouth Port that I had walked earlier in the summer. So the other thing we did here was to acknowledge, um, if you look here, what, what's the most prominent you see? Correct. So as an issue of social justice, to think about the Pilgrim Monument, that was built in 19, I believe it's 07 to 10, maybe dedicated around a little after that. It went up at the same time that most of the Confederate monuments in the South went up. And it was, it was built by a group of descendants from the Mayflower, from Provincetown, but also Brewster. There was a big group in Brewster that combined to build this. And the same time, I believe it was 1914, there was a cross burning by the Klan on the Catholic Church in, in Provincetown. Why might there be some Klan activity? Because Provincetown had shifted from being primarily white descendants of colonists to in the early 1900s, Portuguese gay. And the Portuguese dark-skinned foreigners Catholic. So again, I, didn't, I had not heard anything about this before I, I did this walk. And so we, we started thinking, wow, I just think of Provincetown as this expression, free expression, be who you want to be, everybody's accepted, etc. Well, that maybe wasn't so true a hundred or more years ago. Um, so that's us at the end at the AIDS, AIDS Memorial there. Oh, that was one of the cottage colonies where there were uh, quite a few, because we saw this whole group of folks get on the bus going into Provincetown to do their work that day. I went back around Thanksgiving, and there's all, there's the pilgrims. <laughs> um, and they were doing some reenactment, so I said, oh my god, i got to get my photo with them. All right, so... So a couple of lessons learned here, and then I just would like to hear your thoughts. One is that if we continue to, if, if we just take any like trip, anywhere we go, and think, well, what can I learn from that's different? That's whose stories, who's, who, who do I have not heard about before? When I went, when after this was done, when I went, oh, hang on, it's going to be a photo. Engaging in conversations with people that you don't usually talk to. And just putting yourself in those settings, the more we can do that. What books, movies, museums? Again, before this, I had not heard of the Zion Union Heritage Museum in, in Hyannis. So now I know it. Now I tell other people about it in hopes of you know, getting, getting them more, more activity. And then how do I need to change to incorporate some of this information? So for me, because I've been in education my whole career and a professor, it was now after all these weeks, I have all this information, I have to do something with it. So I was compelled to self-publish a book and start doing these talks and still offer walks. So this summer, every Wednesday, I offered a walk in conjunction with the JFK Museum in Hyannis, and we did it around the similar issues, but right the mile in downtown Hyannis, and then I do them in Brewster or Provincetown. Um, it's been fascinating, a couple hundred people. Those are just some quotes from people on the walk. But this is something really, so again, 2021, I decided to go to Florida for two months. I made a deal with myself. You can go to Florida and play golf if every week you write a chapter of the book. That's what I did. And on the way back, I created a two-week civil rights, civil war tour. Mm -hmm. By myself, stayed in all Airbnbs. But this is Gettysburg, which people might recognize. But I asked my Airbnb host, well, what was going on for the people of color during you know, the Battle of Gettysburg. Her husband took me to the black cemetery of about 40 African-American men who fought with 
the Union troops, but could not be buried there. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away to see that it still existed. And then I went, you know, there's Jefferson Davis on the steps of the Capitol in Alabama. You know, the, the, the slave markets, you know, it was just, I walked through Birmingham where they unleashed the dogs. That on the right is at, uh, not William and Mary, uh, one of the other colleges in the South in Virginia, but that's the list of enslaved people that were sold to help build the college. Washington and Lee, thank you, Washington and Lee. So again, I just turned, you know, I stopped in Mobile, Alabama, and I said, what's going on here? And I said, oh my God, they have an African American heritage trail. I'm going to walk on half of it. To, in October, and now I'm going to go over to Martha's Vineyard and do their African American heritage trail. I've been to the vineyard 10 times. I've never done that. So why not do something like that different? And then I went to went back and visited Plymouth after all of this to really think about what does it really mean, you know, for for the Native Americans there. So that's me and what I did. And I just encourage people through this, you know, to create some experience for yourself. And I'm curious of all the things I mentioned on Cape Cod. Is there something? either that you didn't know you want to explore more about, or something that you would just like to find out more information from what was there. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I want to thank you and say how much I admire how you put your pandemic time to use. Um, it's a very moving enterprise to walk the whole cake, thinking about mm -hmm. and looking for these themes and the people who were overlooked for so long. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I saw on one of your